Hi, I'm Corey Bardman. I'm a professor at the Rockefeller University in New York and an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. I'm going to talk to you today about how we can use genes to understand the brain and behavior. I'll discuss that in the context of our own magnificent human brain and also in the context of simpler brains, brains that range from the brains of worms to flies to mice to dogs. So why should we think that we can understand behavior by studying genes? And why do we think it's important to understand behavior studying genes? To illustrate and answer those points, I'd like to use this first slide to tell you about the familial risk of important psychiatric illnesses. If one member of a pair of identical twins suffers from the neurodevelopmental disorder autism, the identical twin has about a 70% chance of having the same disorder. This is vastly higher than the risk of this disorder in a sibling or in the general population where it's less than 1%. Now the fact that this risk is so high in identical twins, but much lower in non-identical twins, tells us that there is likely to be a genetic contribution to this important psychiatric disorder. The same is seen when examining other important neurological or psychiatric disorders, including the disorders of schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, depression, or anxiety disorders. These are disorders that collectively affect millions of people. They can be severely disabling, in fact, severely disabling even to, short, to the level of shortening the lifespan of the people who are affected. It's very important to us to try to understand what is occurring to allow genes to go wrong and to interact with environmental risks to generate these kinds of problems. So how do we understand what genes can do? What can we learn from studying genes about different kinds of disorders? Well, the very first genetically defined brain disorder called phenylketonuria, or PKU, was identified in 1934, and it already provided for us important information about how understanding brain disorders and the genes behind brain disorders, we can intervene productively to improve the lives of people who study from these disorders. So phenylketonuria is a very severe developmental disorder. Children with phenylketonuria are mentally delayed and retarded, they have delayed social skills, they're hyperactive, they have movement disorders, they have severe seizures. And all of these result from a single change in a single gene, the gene for phenylalanine hydroxylase, a metabolic gene that converts the amino acid L-phenylalanine to L-tyrosine. Why does the absence of this enzyme cause this severe disorder? This information, this chemical information, propagates from the level of the gene to the level of the individual. The gene, a mutation is in phenylalanine hydroxylase, leads to the production of toxic products. These toxic products accumulate in neurons, and because of those toxic products, neurons, which are supposed to have elaborate structures, instead are smaller and simpler in their structure, and many of the neurons die. As a result, the brain of these children has altered function, and the behavior and their medical disorders result. So all of this is a form of toxicology, but once we understood what the gene was, it was immediately clear that this was something that could also be treated, because phenylalanine is a chemical that is present in our diet. And simply by limiting the amount of phenylalanine in the diet of children with PKU, it's possible to limit many of the effects of this very severe disorder. So intervening at an environmental level can lead to great improvements in the health of these individuals. Now, for most brain disorders that I mentioned in the first slide, we don't have anything like this ability to intervene. We don't know the genes as well, we don't know their effects on the brain, and we don't have anything as simple as a dietary fix. But this is our goal, is to be able to understand brains well enough to intervene in each brain disorder, whether at a genetic level, an environmental level, a cellular or a brain level, to try to improve the disorder and the lives of the people suffering from it. So what are the tools we can use to understand these disorders? Well, we believe that these many disorders and many processes of the brain have a biological origin, and that therefore, like all biological processes, they are under the control of our genes. 
When we look at the genes in the human genome, we find, much to our surprise, that while humans are unique and the human brain is unique, the human genes are not unique. Most human genes, the overwhelming majority, are shared with other animals. Only about 1% of all human genes can be considered unique to the human. Another 20% are present in humans and all other vertebrates, although not in simpler animals. Almost half of all human genes are shared between humans and all animals, including butterflies and snails and worms. An additional large fraction are shared even with unicellular organisms like yeasts. And finally, there's a large fraction that are shared even by bacteria and humans. So when we look at this big pie chart, we realize that most of the time, we can understand genes by studying them in much simpler organisms. And we can then take our knowledge of these genes from simple organisms and try to return them to understanding the complex human brain. Now, what about the brain itself? What about this complex structure? Many of you have seen images of the human brain, as shown here at the top. Now, the human brain is very complex. But when we look at the brains of simpler animals, we see that the human brain has evolved from them gradually by changing the size and the placement of common brain regions. And that diverse animals share common brain regions, again, suggesting that we can study them in simpler animals, not just in humans. In fact, we can see when we compare the human and the monkey how similar they are. We can see in the rat and the mouse that some of the same regions are sort of changed in location and changed in size. If we go all the way down to the shark brain, we see something that looks on the outside very different in structure from the human brain below. But by understanding what the different brain regions are, we can see that, in fact, the parts of the shark brain and the parts of the human brain are rather similar, that even the higher processing centers are present in the shark, along with regions that control things like movement and learning. So we believe that we can study brain regions across different species and understand fundamental principles about how brains work. What do we want to know about behavior? What are the organizing principles of behavior? The way that this is studied traditionally is using another science that goes back to the 1930s, a science called neuroethology. Neuroethology is the study of animal behavior, trying to understand common principles and rules that underlie behavior. And a variety of principles have emerged from studying behaviors of many animals. I'll illustrate them here with a few colorful examples. Here, the work of Nico Tinbergen in Stickleback Fish was used to establish the principle that animals have stereotyped behaviors in response to sensory stimuli, that they have innate behaviors that can be reliably observed in all individuals when they encounter certain features of their environments. Now, there are examples of innate behaviors might include courtship or aggression behaviors. They would also include things like food search behaviors. A second principle that emerged from neuroethology is the recognition that the brain does not exist just to respond to the outside world. The brain has its own internal drives that organize behaviors. And a lovely example of this from the work of Conrad Lorenz is the fact that newborn birds, such as ducks and geese, have an internal drive to attach to the first moving object they see. Now, normally, this would be their mother, whom they would follow around throughout their young lives. The mother would then bring them to the right foraging grounds and protect them from danger. Now, in this particular case, these geese saw Conrad Lorenz as the first thing when they hatched. They are now following him around his garden. And this process of imprinting and other kinds of special learning processes are, are observed with respect to these internal drives that animals show to have certain kinds of behaviors. A third principle that emerged from neuroethology is the importance of social behavior and the fact that social behavior is widespread among animals. The most dramatic demonstration of this was the work of Carl von Frisch, who worked on honeybees, simple insects, and showed that they have incredibly elaborate forms of communication and social behaviors. So even insects can show elaborate social structures. For example, the waggle dance that the honeybees use to signal to each other about the presence of food, or the use of pheromones to interact with each other and with their queen. So I'm going to try to illustrate 
these classical questions from neuroethology in the context of modern day genetics and modern day nervous system methods to think of a framework for behavior that incorporates genes, neurons, and brains. This framework here is cartooned on the left, a cartoon that will appear multiple times. We think of environmental cues as leading to perception, decision, and action. And this left side here relates to the basic process of how animals generate innate responses to an environmental cue. But we also have to think that behaviors can be internally generated by internal states and motivation, and that things like memory, of course, will modify all of these outcomes. And I will illustrate how genes affect this right-hand side of the equation as well.